are, we are in week two of this series that, guys, I'll be honest, this is a super challenging series. Hebrews is, is no joke, theologically speaking. It is, it is challenging in every way. I, I really had to, some messages kind of come a little bit easier than others. This was not one of those messages, so I, I, I really had to, I had to really fight for it and, and really, uh, there's so many different ways that you can go with a message, but I always know when God just kind of clicks it at all, it, like it usually in one moment, all of a sudden I'll just have this clarity and then I can finally write. And that's what happened this week. So I'm really, I'm excited. So we're in week two of this series called Jesus is Better. And, and last week, Steve, um, he, he kicked our, the message off and he shared some of the characteristics of Jesus in just the first few verses um, of, of Hebrews chapter 1. It really sets the tone for, for really just how immense the reign of Jesus is. And, and the whole point of Hebrews is to, to show, it was to show the, the Hebrew Christians that were being persecuted, um, that, that were being persecuted in Rome. It was really to give them hope. It was to give them encouragement. It was to give them the, the will to continue on when, when life got hard. And, and we all have that challenge in our lives that there's something that draws, kind of uh, attracts our attention to get us to, to turn back to the way we used to be. So the question is, why did the author of Hebrews feel like it was necessary to write an entire book, of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, right? Because we know that the Bible is the Word of God. It's inspired by God. And, and, and he chose all these different people to be authors, uh, to be his, his scribes. So why did the author decide it was necessary to write an entire book about how Jesus was better than all these different things? You know, it's, we're going to talk today about how Jesus is better than the angels, and there, there are more parts to Hebrews chapter 1 and, and continuing throughout the book of Hebrews about how Jesus is better than the, the Old Testament law, how Jesus is better than Moses, how Jesus is better than the sacrifices, how Jesus is the final revelation of God. Why, why, do, they, why do they need to hear all this, and why do we need to hear it today? So, so we, there are a lot of things we don't know about Hebrews. We don't know who the author is. Uh, some people think it's Paul. A whole lot of people think it's Paul. Uh, but if you, there's a lot of doubt, too, because if you read Hebrews, the, the writing style is very different than a lot of the epistles that Paul wrote. So it's, it's a little bit confusing. But we know that the audience, we, we, very likely, was uh, Jewish Christians that were being persecuted in Rome. And there was a strong temptation because of the persecution that they were experiencing to turn away. There was a strong temptation to turn away. How many of you guys like persecution? Do you understand that even though we don't really have persecution here in the U.S., that the second persecution comes, there will be people that say, I'm not going to church again because I don't want to risk, I don't want to risk myself. I, I don't want to go to church again if I'm going to risk losing my status at, at, at work. When persecution comes, people tend to scatter. Why? Because we enjoy the path of least resistance. That's human nature, right? That's just human nature. It doesn't make you bad, but we have temptations to turn away when the pressure gets turned up. They also knew that uh, their Jewish beliefs would not make them targets of persecution, so they were tempted to go back. Uh, think of it like this. It seems a lot easier in a moment um, when you're on the south side of Chicago. I if you are walking on one side of the street and you see gang members coming your way, it seems a whole lot better to walk across the street to avoid them. Avoid them. But here's what I learned about working on the south side of Chicago. If you do that, they follow you more. Right? right? So sometimes for us, we think that avoiding persecution is the goal, and we think that we know how to do it and how God's going to work out the details in our lives. But a lot of times, just like, with, just like when you encounter gangs, the best thing you can do is look at them in the eyes to help, help them understand that you're a human being too. Don't get scared and keep moving. You don't stop and hang out. You don't try to talk. You just keep walking. But if you walk across the street, good chance you're going to get followed. I've experienced this before. So, so they knew that if they turned back, they wouldn't necessarily be targets the same way. But it was about more than that. It was about more than that. Because many of the connections that we read about in the Old Testament, we see that God encountered humans through the, the intermediary relationship 
uh, with angels. So angels were often the messengers. We see like the, the, the angel of the Lord. And we, we, exp- we, we see that Moses received the law from angels from God. So God to angels to Moses. So there was a high view of angels in the Old Testament. And how many of you guys know that, that a good thing is not always a great thing? So sometimes the, angels are good, but if we focus so much on angels, we forget the Lord who created them. And isn't that our temptation in all of, of the human experience? It is to take something that is good in creation and elevate it to a, to a place that is, is far higher than it's supposed to, to be in our lives. Marriage is a great thing, Right? For most people, amen. Are you guys are you guys with me on this? Like, I, I I need every husband to be like, oh, it is the best. It is the best, right? Mar- marriage, marriage is an awesome thing, particularly when it's done the way God intends for it to be done, right? Where where, where husbands lay down their lives for their wives and, and and wives want to respect their husbands. Like, man, I'll tell you, that's like a key thing for husbands. It is some of the biggest arguments in marriages are, are when husbands feel disrespected, right? How many of you guys have just been like, you can't say that to me in public. That, that embarrassed me. It took my man card away. <laughs> and and how, many, how, many women, how many women here are just like, man, if you would just live in a respectful way, then I would be more likely to respect you, <laughs> right? It's kind of a give and take. So, so husbands, don't, don't try to demand respect. There, there's, nothing, there's, there's no lesser respect that you're going to get than if you try to demand respect, right? It, it's, a, it's a choice uh, to be a respectful person so that you receive respect. I totally uh, went off track there talking about marriage. This, this sermon actually has very little to do with marriage. Um, but thank you for uh, being my free therapy this morning. So God encountered man through angels in the Old Testament, and, and it's very likely that, that the, the Jewish Christians thought, you know, I want to go back to those good old days. That was a pretty good religion that we practiced. So not only would we not be persecuted if we turn back to that belief, but, but angels are important anyway. So what's the big deal? We need, it's okay for us to focus on angels. And the author of Hebrews is saying, no, we have to, we, we have to focus on the most important thing, and because we have a forward-thinking God. How many of you guys know that God is always doing a new thing? Isn't that awesome? He is not stuck on the pages of the Bible because the, the Bible is alive, it's active. Jesus is the Word. So Jesus is, is the perfect, the Word is the perfect representation of who Jesus is. And, and who does Jesus perfectly represent? He represents God. So when you see Jesus, you have seen God. If you have encountered Jesus, you know God. Isn't that awesome? It's an awesome thing. So why is it important for us today to read about the plight of the Jewish Christians and the persecution that they had 2,000 years ago? Now, guys, I already said this, but I would argue that, that as Christians in the U.S., we really don't have much persecution. And you'll say, wait a second. But, but at Christmas, when I went to Target and I was in the checkout line, I said Merry Christmas to the cashier. And you know what she said? She said Happy Holidays back. (laughs) Man, Christians just aren't respected in the U.S. Well, you know what? I would would agree that Christians a lot of times are not respected in the U.S. And I would also agree that when we make arguments like that to gain respect as Christians, we are the cause often of the reason why we don't have a lot of respect (laughs) in our culture. Okay? Amen. Thank you, Tony. We don't, have, uh, we don't have a lot of persecution. And here's the thing. Christians in the U.S., we can really get caught up with, with anything and put it in front of Jesus because the, the thing about persecution is persecution really helps you solidify your faith because when you're persecuted, you have to decide what's most important to you. Christians all throughout the rest of the world, do you know that when they declare that they are followers of Jesus Christ, it actually costs them something huge? A lot of times it costs them their families, it costs them their work, it costs them their relationships, they're banished, they're, they're burned, they're killed. Horrible things happen to Christians around the world. For us, it really doesn't necessarily cost us those things. But Jesus asked for us, no matter where we are, to center our lives on him, to give him first place, and when we do that, it will cost us something. But in our culture, it's more likely that instead of running away from persecution, 
We run, we're tempted to run to things like anything that will give us pleasure, anything that can distract us, whether it's work or family or friends, whether it's, it's opioids or alcohol. Like we, we turn to all these different things. We turn to Netflix and we turn to YouTube. We turn to anything to distract us from the thing that God says, I want you to focus on the most. And some of those things aren't necessarily bad, but when we are distracted, when we live uh, disconnected from God being in first place, we, we've given up, we've given up the, 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 the order of things, and then we wonder why life doesn't work quite right. Life will never work the way it's supposed to if we don't put Jesus, if we don't enthrone Jesus where he is designed to be enthroned in our lives and in our hearts. So we need to be reminded because we have a human tendency to look backward in our lives and wear rose-colored glasses, rose-colored lenses. Have you experienced that before? Maybe you became a Christian in the last couple of years and, and sort of the novelty of that experience has worn off. And now you're kind of looking back and you're like, you know, some of those things that I did, they, they're really not all that bad. You know, I think God's okay with that. And, you know, the Christian life isn't quite as exciting as I'd planned for. So I'm, I'm going to go back to those things and and God's like, no, keep walking, keep walking, keep going, keep walking with me. I told you I'd never leave you or forsake you. Keep walking and you'll experience me in deeper ways. So I love it um, that in our church community, we, we do believe what the Bible has to say. I really love it. Um, now, now, here's the thing. We all know that we have a lot to learn um, in it. And we, we know that we're not, we're not the cornerstone of all the knowledge of what Scripture has to say. We, we, we humbly submit that to you, that we don't get it all. We're, we're trying to with good hearts, but we don't rely on our own thoughts um, to come up here and to try to shape your lives. But we trust that as we internalize the Word of God, that God is going to give something good to you from Scripture through us. And we're just grateful to get to be a part of it. I have to say, it's honestly one of my greatest honors. Every time I get up to preach, I, I feel a heavy weight of responsibility and a total excitement to discharge it. Does that make sense? Like, I'm just like, I am so thrilled to be able to, I, I'm like, Lord, I get to do this? Of all the people you could have picked, you pick me and you allow me to get up and, and share this? I'm, I'm just, I'm so grateful for it. And I'm grateful to serve in a church community that believes the word of God. It's always going to be the focal point for our community. The Bible is the focus because it reveals Jesus to us. So as we go through this series, uh, we're going to ask God to help us to take information. Hebrews is very heavy on information, but what we have to grab a hold of is not just information, but it's information that leads to transformation. Because if we're not careful, we could study the book of Hebrews and have a whole lot of information. And, and do you know what information does when it does not lead to transformation? It leads to jerks. <laughs> it leads to jerks. Some of the meanest people I've ever encountered know more scripture than any of us in this room. Let's not be people who take information so that we can beat people up. Let's take information so that we can be transformed and we can invite others into the transforming relationship that Jesus promises to bring. Wouldn't that be an awesome, wouldn't that be an awesome way for all of us to choose to live? So let's do, let's do that. There, there, but there's a lot of teaching in the book of Hebrews, and we have to learn information for, for the transformation to ignite, but let's not just leave it as information. So can we just... Uh, However you want to pray, I just, invite, I just invite all of you to just close your eyes. And, and as I pray, um, it, it, we could fill this whole place just asking God, if you want to just give your own voice to this, but I, I'm just going to ask God to speak to us and transform us today. But I invite you to also uh, pray um, verbally as, as I pray right now. Father, we lift our voices to you and our hearts to you. God, we invite your Holy Spirit here to speak to us. God, help me to get out of your way. Help me to just be a vehicle for your words. And I pray that your words, God, um, we, we know what Scripture says, that, that not one word that, that leaves your mouth returns void. So I pray, God, that whatever purpose you have today 
in this, in this uh, speaking of your word, God, that, that you would accomplish that purpose, that you would change us, that you would transform us. God, I pray that we would not seek to know information so that we can be smarter, but that we would seek to know you through your word so that we can be changed. So Lord, we love you and, and we're grateful for what you're going to do today. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Okay, guys, if you have your Bible with you, um, open it to Hebrews chapter 1. We're looking at verses 4 through 14. If you don't have a Bible with you, I'm going to send you to Bible purgatory. Um, you've already failed at this miserably, so I'm just teasing. It's right behind us on the screens. Um, but we do encourage you to have Scripture with you. I, I, I don't often read a, a a paper Bible anymore. I do it on my phone or on my iPad, so uh, no judgment. Um, if you're sitting next to someone who just has a phone out, um, hopefully they're not just checking their email. Hopefully they're actually reading scripture today. Um, but if they're not, there's a little bit of grace too, because we've all done it. Amen? Yeah. Amen? Okay. Sometimes I'm the worst listener as a pastor. <laughs> I can get easily distracted, and it's not because Steve's not awesome and Tony's not awesome. Awesome guys, they're great preachers, but I can get really, really distracted, so forgive me. Do you guys forgive me? Yeah, you're a little questionable there. Okay, thanks. Hebrews 1, verses 4 through 14. It says, So he became, speaking of Jesus, as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son? Today I have become your father. Or again, I will be his father and he will be my son. And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. And speaking of the angels, he says, he makes his angels spirits and his servants flames of fire. But about the son, he says, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. A scepter of justice will be the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. He also says, in the beginning, Lord, you laid the foundations of the earth, and the heavens are the works of your hands. They will perish, but you remain. They will all wear out like a garment. You will roll them up like a robe. Like a garment, they will be changed. But you remain the same, and your years will never end. To which of the angels did God ever say, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet? Are not all angels ministering spirits sent to serve those who will inherit salvation? So you notice kind of a pattern there. It's sort of this rapid fire, um, kind of like this disarming, oh, you think the angels are important, and the author just goes, boom, 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 boom. Are they that important? You know, just one thing after another. And it, the, 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 the writing pattern was designed to disarm the argument. It was basically like, hey, if you thought the angels were really important, let me just tell you a few things about the King Jesus. Let me tell you a few things about him. And it's just boom, 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 all the way down the line. But what does it have to do with us today? I think this is really significant because um, Hebrews, uh, the, the book of Hebrews demonstrates that the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. Hebrews demonstrates that the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament through Jesus Christ. That is super, super important. And a lot of Christians don't really gra grab a hold of that truth. I remember when I first became a Christian, uh, one of the things that I wanted to do, I, I wanted to read the, the red letters of Jesus. I, I don't know if when you first became a Christian, I, I, uh, what, what you did, but I was, I was so focused on, I want his words, and I know the other stuff, you know, it's, it's in there, but I really want to focus on his words. And those were, I had great intentions in doing that. I mean, I, I really did have good intentions. I wanted to hear directly from Jesus. But, but here's the problem with that thinking. It's not biblical. It's not biblical to say, well, I'm just going to look at the red letters of Jesus. And then the rest of it's kind of questionable. Because the Bible testifies about itself that the whole of Scripture, the totality of Scripture, is all breathed from God. 
So it's not just the red words that you see in the Bible from Jesus. Jesus is called the word in John chapter 1, the same word that was with God in Genesis chapter 1. John 1 testifies to that. The very same Jesus was, that, that was with God in the beginning was also God and was, the, was there at the very creation of all things in Genesis. The same Jesus that came to earth in the form of of a humble man is the same one who died on the cross, who was with God in the beginning and was God in the beginning. Isn't that just like mind-blowing? So we don't really understand the Trinity, do we? Don't trust anyone who says they have a great grasp of the Trinity. It's complex, and we don't have anything on earth that we can look at and say, I mean, the, 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 the examples that I've heard, I remember when I first became a Christian, they were like, well, you know how water has different forms? And I'm like, no, that's not going to cut it for me. That's just not going to do it. Certainly, the Trinity is more complex uh, than the form of water. But he was the same God in the very beginning. So all of Scripture, all of Scripture testifies to this Jesus who is coming. Jesus is found in the very first line of Scripture. Genesis 1.1, it says, In the beginning, God. And the word for God in, the, in, that, in that passage is Elohim. It's a plural we, we literally meet the Trinity in the very first verse of the first chapter of the first book of the Bible. Isn't that awesome? So right from the beginning, Jesus was there. He was there in the very beginning, and he was the creator of all things. So as Christians, for us to have a full understanding of the Bible— we, we can't just look at the red words of Jesus. We have to look at the, the whole of Scripture to have a full appreciation of who this Jesus is. To me, it's, it's just absolutely incredible. The Jesus who died on the cross was the Jesus who was with the Father in the beginning, who was also the Jesus who, who had a plan to deal with the very first sin in the third chapter of the book of Genesis. And we read about what this plan was right away. So Jesus wasn't, he didn't have to come up with something on the fly. Jesus wasn't surprised by sin. He was hurt by sin, but he had a plan right from the start. Genesis 3, verse 21. This is what happened right after sin was committed. It says, The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Do you know what the difference is between what we do about our sin and what God does? We try to cover up our sin. Adam and Eve made fig leaves when they realized they were naked after they'd eaten from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. They tried to cover it up, and God's like, no, it's not about covering. I, I'm going to, I, I'm the one, I'm the one who is going to deal with your sin. I'm going to give you new clothes. And it's going to be clothes that were costly. Because that's the record we have. If it came from skin, we're not talking Hannibal Lecter here. This was the skin of an animal that had to die. Blood was shed right from the very start. It's a picture of the gospel we get in Genesis 3, 21. Blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of sin. For us to receive clothes of righteousness, blood had to be shed. And God did it right there for us. We try to cover it up and he's like, no, I've got new clothes for you. And they're better than, than trying to cover things up. So here's our second point today. Hebrews shows us the importance of right belief. Hebrews shows us the importance of right belief. There's so many beliefs that people have, right? So many things that, that, that people believe. And, and a lot of these beliefs, I mean, I, I meet people of, of different faiths all the time. And, and they are, man, these, are, these aren't people trying to deceive you, a lot of them. These are people who have sincerely held beliefs. And, and what we get in the world is, hey, man, we need, to, we need to just let people believe whatever they want. And to some extent, I, I agree with that because we should have the freedom to choose. <clears throat> people who are compelled to choose Jesus because of a threat of violence, they, they don't really choose Jesus, right? But, but people should have freedom to choose a belief but people, who hold, people can hold uh, beliefs in a totally sincere way and be sincerely wrong. Not all beliefs are true just because we ascribe to them. Can we acknowledge that? 
Hebrews shows us the importance of right belief. But it's not just about right belief, it's how we convey it. Because they're, like we just talked about it a minute ago, sometimes Christians get a, a, a bad reputation in the community, and, and sometimes that's our fault because of how we convey our beliefs. If we, if we choose to, to, to die on the hill of, of, of Target didn't uh, respond to me with Merry Christmas, but, but just Happy Holidays, if we die on that hill, we're never going to make an impact in our culture with the love of Jesus. It's how we convey things, isn't it? Colossians 4, 6, uh, the Apostle Paul said, Let your conversation be always full of grace. Ouch. Huh? He doesn't say be difficult and contentious. He says, let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And it's like, okay, so we do need information. We need right belief. But right belief only goes as far as how we share that belief. So we need to be careful, and we need to be gentle, we need to be humble in how we share. Um, I, I was really tested in the last week or so uh, by this. Uh, how many of you guys feel like social media is, uh, in some ways, a beautiful way to uh, dialogue with people, but then some days you're like, Jesus, I'm about to go all in on that person. Have you felt that? Have you felt like that before? So two, two television shows I was on um, representing Stacey Peterson and victims of domestic violence. And um, I posted those shows with, with the, s- some stills from the, the shows. And, and I had so much support, so much kindness, so much goodness, and one troll. <laughs> and this troll, man, sometimes, sometimes you, you have this idea, don't feed the trolls. And I, I really do agree with that. But this guy did not need any fuel. He had all of the fuel that he needed in and of himself. I think he was like a, a self-created and self-contained troll. It was, it was nuts. And I want to thank some of you guys like jumped in on my behalf. Thank you for that. You don't have to feel like you need to jump in and defend me, but I'm not going to hate you if you do. So I'm just going to be honest about it. But I resisted. I'm like, Lord, please, please control my, tweet, my Twitter fingers right now. Because I want to go in and I've got a response to this guy. And, but, but you know what I know? I know that Colossians 4, 6 is true. I know that when I represent Jesus, it's not just representing him when I'm on the clock. It's not just, it's not just when I'm at home. It's also in, in how I convey myself on social media. It's how people at the gas station encounter me that's by my house. It's how I act when I'm at the gym. It's all of these things. Being a Christian is not a part-time excursion. It is an all-encompassing experience of our lives. And people are watching. They're always watching, particularly on social media. And guys, I I love what, what Taylor said. He goes, and when you fail, thank you for that, because sometimes I do fail on social media. Sometimes I do, but I'm trying to get better at it. Okay, so I appreciate the grace. So, so the author of Hebrews in this section is trying to make it abundantly clear that Jesus is better than the angels. And, um, and that didn't just have application to the first century Jewish Christians. It has application to your lives when you hear that knock on your door. Usually it's between 9 and 11 a.m. on a Saturday. And you think, how dare you come and disturb the one moment of my life where I get to sit and have coffee? And then you look, you, you, peek, out, you peek out the window or, or through the, the little peephole and you see two impeccably dressed people. <laughs> they are just dressed to the nines. And you're like, I didn't know I got invited to go to the ball, you know? And, and, and they're, they're standing there and usually they're, they're very nice looking, very nice clothes, and, they're, and you are just, you're a filthy, sweats wearing wreck, and your hair is all, blah, 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 and, and you're drinking the coffee, and you're trying not to, to be bitter as you see them at your door, and usually they're holding, they're holding a Bible, so they're very official. They're holding a Bible, and, and then they're also holding a publication called The Watchtower. Maybe, you, maybe you've seen this before, and, and that's a publication of the Jehovah's Witnesses. 
Here's what's interesting about the book of Hebrews. The first chapter of the book of Hebrews shoots down one of the major premises that the the impeccably dressed, uh, good-looking couple standing outside of your door is ready to bring to you. In one verse, literally one leg of belief uh, of Jehovah's Witnesses is ripped down. It's verse 6. It says this, And again, when God brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels worship him. Let all God's angels worship him. Now that verse is particularly troubling for Jehovah's Witnesses for for one main reason. Jehovah's Witnesses have a belief that Jesus is the New Testament version of the Archangel Michael. They believe that those are the same people. And they they believe that, that Jesus was the first created being. Well, here's the problem with that. Jesus was not created, and Jesus is not an angel. And they'll say, but it says he was the firstborn right there in verse 6. Well, here's the problem with that. There are two things that we learn as we study Scripture, so we study this passage. The first thing is this. The author is not suggesting that Jesus is created like, like, um, like a child is the product of the, of the marriage union. He's not suggesting that at all. The author is speaking about an order of things. He's speaking about um, the the, the rank of importance in the universe. He's talking about a right of inheritance. He is not speaking of being born. Because Jesus was not born. Jesus just is. And that blows our minds every time we we try to grasp it. It it also... um, it, 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 it also is uh, disturbing to the belief of Jehovah's Witnesses because um, they, they always say, we shouldn't worship anything but God. And we can say to them, yes, we agree, and Jesus is God because God himself says, let all God's angels worship him. So, so church, who, who is it that, that we're instructed um, by the Bible to worship? Is it just anyone who comes your way who, who, who has a greater status than you? No. Only God is to be worshipped. And the author of Hebrews is saying Jesus is God and the angels are even required to worship him. Jesus is not an angel and he was never born. He just is. He's the uncreated one, just like his father and just like the Holy Spirit. Nobody created them. But the most dangerous belief systems, I believe, in the whole world are not ones that that just cut Jesus out of the picture. Those are really obvious. I believe wholeheartedly that the most dangerous belief systems in the world are the ones that ascribe a lot of stature to Jesus. The people that say, actually, I have more respect for Jesus than you do. Have you heard that from anybody? A lot of world religions, they they hold Jesus in very, very high regard. But here's the difference. Only Christianity says that he is the son of God who came to take away the sins of the world. That's the difference between our faith and every other faith. Only the Jesus of the Bible can do that. That makes him greater. That leads us to our final point today. And I'm going to ask the band to come back up to get ready to to close us in worship. Hebrews invites us to answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? Hebrews invites us to answer the question, who do you say Jesus is? Like I said at the start of the message, information is good, but it's what you do with it that counts. So you can read this and you can see very clearly that God is trying to make this point about Jesus. And you can read through all the things that he says about how much better Jesus is than the angels. And you can still walk out of here completely not changed by that reality. So the author of Hebrews is inviting you to a step. So I don't know where you are with the Lord today, what you believe about God, what you think about the fact that you're, you, you commit sins. I don't know where you are with all those things, but I want you to consider this. The author of Hebrews is saying that Jesus is God, so what are you going to do with Jesus? What will you do today with Jesus? Uh, the, the, the last thing I want, the, the, the very last thing that you should do today this is not the goal of this, of this message, is walk out of here with more information. If you do that, you miss the whole point. 
but take this information and, and be led to transformation. You've got to stand on what you believe to be true. And I'm inviting you to make that decision today. Do you believe deep down, maybe you wouldn't say it naturally, but do you believe that if you do enough good things, if, if your, your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, that, that somehow God will then allow you to get into heaven? It's just not true. You can't. Jesus said that no one comes to the Father except through him. No one. Do you believe in Jesus, but you think that maybe deep Bible study is your key to God answering your prayers? Maybe you won't say that, but that's how you live. Romans 3.22 tells us that righteousness is given to all of us freely as we put our faith in Jesus Christ. James 5.16 5, says that's what makes our prayers effective. It's righteousness. And that has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with Jesus. Everything to do with him. On your worst day, the worst day that you've ever had in your life, Jesus loves you no less. No less. I bet you there have been a lot of bad days in this week for people here in the church. And there will be in this coming week. There are always going to be bad days. And you're always going to fail but the question is, will you put your hope in how good you can be or will you put your hope and your faith into the one who was good enough for you to come home? He's the only one. Jesus is the answer. It's not your own efforts that will ever lead you to God. If you want to commit your life to Jesus for the first time, the Bible tells you how to do it. I think sometimes we sort of make up our own game plan. We just decide, okay, well, I'm going to really try to be good enough. I'm really going to try hard to stop sinning. And, then, and then, I, then I'll commit to Jesus because certainly he doesn't want me with all of my mess. No, actually, you can't come to him until you confess all of your mess. And you say, I don't want to live this way any longer. And I know that even though I will screw up still, you are with me because you gave me your character. You took my sin and you gave me your goodness. You gave me your righteousness. And I receive that and I stand before God one day and I'll say, I appeal to you, God, on the basis of what your son did for me, not on any bad thing I've done or any good thing I've done, but I appeal to you on the basis of the blood of your son who was in the beginning. That's my basis. Here's how you do it. Acts 2.38. I share this almost every time I preach. Why? Why? because I have a powerful view of heaven because some of my favorite people have gone on. Do you know that the longer you live, the more you see people that you love go on to heaven, the stronger you have a taste for heaven because the people you love are already there. And then you recognize that they're with the Jesus that you're talking about, that you're living for. And one day you will be there with them. That's powerful. So why do I have such a focus? Man, why does he always say Acts 2.38. We've heard that before because not everybody has repented and been baptized. Not everyone, just because they come to church, has, has, has followed God's plan of salvation. Acts 2.38, it says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. All this means is this. God's invitation to you is to take this information in Hebrews and all throughout Scripture. And his invitation is for you to examine your lives, for, for the word to, to, to bring conviction, to, 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 to make you unstable feeling in your heart because you've lived your own way. And he invites you to, to then turn and to walk the other way, but not your own way, not a different way. He invites you to, to go to the one who made a way for you to come home by living a perfect life because you can't. And he died a perfect death because you won't. And he defeated sin, and that's his invitation to you. Will you receive it? Will you receive it? Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will, this is the promise, you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's powerful. 
That means the Holy Spirit is with you from that moment. The Holy Spirit of God who was in the beginning. That's awesome. And you won't go to heaven without him. So I invite you, if you haven't done this, make that decision. And if you, if you know that you're, you're sitting here and you know that you're a follower of Jesus, but, but, but you put other things first, just take the next few moments and just say, God, forgive me. I confess to you that I've put other things before you. I confess that I've gotten distracted by, 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 by finances and, and by um, substances, if you have. Whatever it is that's gotten in your way of your view of putting Jesus in first place. All those other things will be swept away, but Jesus is and was and is to come. He is the great I am. Let's pray. Father, your ways are higher than our ways. You are better than any other thing. Lord, whatever it is that we've placed before you, God, just in our hearts right now, we offer that thing up to you. Lord, forgive us when we choose to go a different way. We receive that clean slate that you offer us in every moment. We thank you for your grace. May we live gracious lives. And may every conversation we have with others about you be seasoned with grace like Colossians 4 tells us. Lord, I pray a blessing over this whole community, over our, our church family, our church friends, God. Help us to internalize this, God. And may your spirit bring it all to life as we encounter people differently this week because of your word. God, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And the church said...